days after Pesach, putting it in the third month after, so this relationship is biblically reasonable. And so um, God gives the uh, commandments, commandments regarding Shavuot in Exodus 23, Leviticus 23, Numbers 28, and Deuteronomy 16. Verse 9, you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to Yahweh your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as Yahweh your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before Yahweh your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are among you, at the place where Yahweh your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you are a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before Yahweh your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before Yahweh empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of Yahweh your God, which he has given you. Now I was considering discussing the counter of the Omer, or Weeks, but then I recall Dan's commentary about avoiding calendar controversies a few weeks back. So I thought it might be a good idea to uh, take his advice. Okay, uh, so, to continue, let's take a quick look at Shavuot in the New Testament. Since Shavuot occurs 50 days after Passover, Hellenistic Jews gave it the name Pentecost, or 50th day. And we read about Pentecost in the New Testament, in Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, uh, I read the, this following connection on uh, Passion for Truth email, and uh, Craig uh, referred to it a little bit earlier, but Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. John 4, 23, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the Feast of Weeks and Pentecost memorializes the day the truth, the Torah, and the Spirit were both given. Now, I know we got kids in here today without the Shabbat school, so if, I won't feel offended if you take them out. And if you want, you can bring them up here like we did with Phil Joel, and I can make them read some, and <laughs> maybe that'll scare them. Okay, so. As I continued reading about Shavuot, I discovered what I'd like to spend the rest of this time discussing. Continuing on Wikipedia, it mentioned there are five books in Tanakh that are known as megalot, or scrolls, and are publicly read in the synagogues on different Jewish holidays. Lamentations on Tisha B'Av, Ecclesiastes on Sukkot, Esther on Purim, the Song of Songs on Passover, and the Book of Ruth is read on Shavuot because, along with other rabbinical reasons, Shavuot is harvest time, and the events of the Book of Ruth occur at harvest time. And the central theme of the book is loving kindness, and the Torah is about loving kindness. And I just happened to have gone through uh, several podcasts and YouTube videos about the book of Ruth. But then I recalled in Dan's commentary, he said not to discuss other people's teachings. <laughs> so I thought it would probably be a good idea to ignore this advice. <laughs> and so, um, no, this, I think, I mean, I've listened to it, I've really, I really like this guy, I think he's really spot on and stuff. Okay, so I'll be reading through the Book of Ruth and also going through this blueprint in closer detail. Okay, so Ruth 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass, in the days when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, 
The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Hilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Now, going to Moab was disobedience on the part of Elimelech and his family. Matthew goes into a lot of detail on this, but just to uh, quickly go show some scripture about it. Deuteronomy 23.3, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of Yahweh forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of, when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, Yahweh your God would not listen to Balaam, but Yahweh your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, because Yahweh your God loves you. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. It's commonly believed the prophet Samuel wrote the book of Ruth to testify of King David's lineage that he had a right to the throne. Using the meanings of the names of the characters and places, here's how Samuel's contemporaries would have understood the first part of Ruth. Now it came about in the days when God was king that he sent a test by a famine to the land. And a certain man of the house of bread, Bethlehem, and the land of praise, went to live in Moab, a place which God had strictly forbidden Israelites to go with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man who disobeyed God, the king, was, My God is King. And the name of his wife, Pleasant. The names of his two sons were Diseased and Devoured. They were from the area of fruitfulness, from a town called the House of Bread, in the land of Praise. Now they entered the land of Moab and stayed there. So look at the blueprint See, first, God sending a test through famine. And God chooses Israel to be a light. And we've got a disobedient Israel, represented by Elimelech, leaving, while the faithful remnant stays. And Elimelech's disobedience represents Israel disobeying God. But through this disobedience, mercy was brought to the Gentiles. So we continue. Ruth 1.3, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Mahlon and Hilion also died, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. So my God is king, Pleasant's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They did the worst thing possible. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. Now, this is the same thing that happened. We were looking at ba uh, Balaam, Balaam earlier. Remember, he tricked the Israelites into taking Moabite women as wives. So, okay, the name of the land, or the name of the one, uh, Orpah, was back of the neck, or to like turn your back. And the name of the other, Ruth, was friend. God gave Pleasant and her two sons about ten years to repent and return to him and their inheritance, but they stayed in Moab. So God took the lives of diseased and devoured, and Pleasant was bereft of her two children and her husband. So now Moab was cursed, just like uh, the Gentiles are under the curse of sin. We see God begins the mercy to the Gentiles, as Ruth being with uh, Naomi's family for 10 years, she was undoubtedly, undoubtedly learning of the God of Israel. It's like Matthew talks about in the book, it's like they most likely didn't completely abandon Yahweh, but they tried to bring him along with the gods of the Moabites and stuff. Okay, and so, uh, and we see Naomi's husband and sons perish, which is uh, prophetic of uh, Israel suffering great loss and almost perishing in diaspora, God chastening Israel. Uh, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that Yahweh had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And so Ruth ministers to Naomi, just as Gentiles minister to 
or should be ministering to unredeemed Israel. And Naomi turns her ear back to God. So Israel hears of the homeland and possible return. Okay, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. Yahweh deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Yahweh grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. Yahweh do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. So we see uh, the Gentiles who know of God, who know of the God of Israel, face a decision: stay in Moab or return home. And like Orpah, see Gentiles mixing God and paganism, returning to the mixed paganism. And when you like think about it. As we read just, just now, Orpah did go a little ways with Naomi for a while. It's kind of like how, I mean, most of the mainstream church go, get into, uh, into Christianity. They uh, will, like, reject the Jewish roots of it, the, he- the Hebraic roots and stuff, and go back to, like, and keep doing Christmas and Easter and stuff. And, of course, most of that is un- I mean, I didn't, I didn't know about the time, so just uh, everyone's watching podcasts or whatever. I'm not being condemning, just so I point out. Um, okay, but otherwise, we see the Ruth like Gentiles fully aligned with Israel. Ruth chooses the God of Israel alone. Okay, so uh, verse 18 when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now, the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened, when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? So Naomi and Ruth return. It says Israel's unredeemed uh, remnant returns with the help of Gentiles. It says Ruth helped Naomi, the Gentile helping the unredeemed Israel. But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Remember, Naomi meant pleasant, Mara means bitter. I went out full, and Yahweh has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since Yahweh has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returns bitter against God. So, uh, uh, draws a link to uh, the unredeemed Israel after the Holocaust. Okay, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her, her daughter-in-law, with her. Just to mention quickly, uh, throughout the book of Ruth, it conti- uh, several times it will refer to Ruth as Ruth the Moabitess to keep pointing that out, that, that she's a Moabitess and stuff. They make that, they make that point. So. Okay, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem, at the beginning of barley harvest. Okay, now you can all read this, and I'll wait till you're done. Nope. <laughs> so, <laughs> something Matthew talks about is how Ruth is commonly looked at as a love story between her and a handsome, strong Boaz. However, 
uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew Wilson uses some math to determine that Boaz was probably over 110 years old and maybe even older. This is on the back of the blueprint if anyone really wants to see it later on. So we go to chapter 2. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So Ruth seeks refuge and sustenance in the fields of Boaz. Says Ruth, like Gentiles, seek refuge with the God of Israel alone and forsake their pagan ways. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, Yahweh be with you. And they answered him, Yahweh bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Now keep in mind from Deuteronomy 23.3, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of Yahweh forever. So the servants were most likely unhappy having Ruth around. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So Ruth meets Boaz, and Boaz has mercy on Ruth. This says, Gentiles meet the God of Israel, and we receive mercy. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Yahweh repay your work, and a full reward be given you by Yahweh, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. So we see Boaz knew all about Ruth before he ever saw her. She, uh, he had heard about her, but just didn't know what she looked like up to this point. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Now notice that Boaz himself was serving Ruth and not one of his servants. So we see Boaz makes Ruth equal with his servants. It says, Ruth, like Gentiles, are shown mercy, made equal with faithful Israel. See, going along with uh, being grafted in, like Daniel was talking about yesterday. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also, let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. So Ruth works alongside the faithful servants of Boaz until the harvest is complete. It says Gentile believers should work alongside Messianic believers to gather in the harvest that brings Israel to jealousy. Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. Okay, so Ruth shares blessings from Boaz with Naomi. 
It says that Gentiles share blessings from God with Israel. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. So Naomi receives blessing from Boaz through Ruth. She says Israel receives blessings from God through Gentile believers. Unredeemed Israel is jealous of the Gentile salvation. <clears throat> then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of Yahweh, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Now when Naomi says kindness to the living and the dead, she's referring to the fact that Boaz is showing kindness to his relative, Eli Melech's family, even though he has passed. So Naomi is no longer bitter. She becomes pleasant again. It says, Israel's heart softens towards God, no longer bitter. God pours out spirit of grace and supplication. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, and that people do not meet you in any other field. So Ruth spent all her days working with the servants of Boaz, representative of Messianic Jews, who helped give her extra grain to bring home every night to Naomi. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest. She dwelt with her mother-in-law. Notice it's two different harvest times, giving an idea of how long Ruth was working with Boaz. Go on to chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So Naomi decides to be redeemed. It says that Israel calls out Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai. Unredeemed Israel asks God to redeem her. This requires a son, and needs Ruth. Now, Matthew explains in his study how the son of a remarried widow would receive the inheritance of the widow's first husband. For example, Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead, of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. The, her husband's brother shall go into, her, go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son, which she bores, will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies. You shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. He will tell you what you should do. She said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. So you see, Ruth gets instructions from Naomi. Says Gentile believers learn how to approach the Father. Fullness of Gentiles comes in Ruth like Gentiles, as Ruth like Gentiles become Messiah like, willing to sacrifice for Israel. Now, um, I think of when I watch some of the Yeshua's Harvest videos and how the Jewish believers had such a deep understanding and deep relationship with God. They've been walking with God and studying his word for thousands of years, and we can learn a lot from them. I'm not saying that they're all perfect, and because I, like, I went and visited, like, checked out some of the sites, some, like, believe Christmas, some have brought in, like, other stuff that the Christian church has brought in and everything. But um, this got me thinking, going, ablibing a little bit here, uh, in one of, the, one of the podcasts, not about Ruth, but uh, Matthew Wilson does a separate podcast, and uh, they're talking about um, how, like, how like Jewish people aren't so, don't read things so hyper-literally. Like, uh, and that, that's kind of more of a Greek, Greek idea. And uh, I seem to notice that in a lot of uh, like, uh, Hebrew roots teachings I see, or like, like messianic teachings and stuff, while well, we talk about like uh, the Gentile church, like bringing in like 
pagan influence, and it has, I actually see a lot of kind of like Greek mindset in the way these Hebrew roots and some of these other places are teaching there too. Like, it's kind of like they, they'll take a text and like hyper literally analyze it, or like, and maybe even like misunderstand words of how like the, is, how like the, the authors of the Bible intended and stuff, and then they'll build the theology on that. And, uh, uh, and this is kind of going back to Dan's commentary a little while about checking out other, watching other teachings and stuff. And you've got to really be careful and really um, encourage everyone to be reading your Bibles. I mean, as much, and not just the Torah portion for the week, but like the rest of the Tanakh, the New Testament, shows how uh, Jewish believers understood the Bible, shows how God reacted to what they did and how. And, it gives like a lot of understanding on the Torah. And I will also, uh, often refer to Daniel's teachings a lot in like other commentaries and stuff. And it's because I, I see him use like more scripture and more like historical and biblical context than I see, I've seen anywhere. And maybe, uh, I guess, I guess this series, uh, would be, uh, would be close up there, like what I've gone through in here. But uh, so I just I know like a lot of I started coming while he was in the Galatians series. I know other people come around that time. There's a lot of teachings even before that that I really recommend checking out. And like uh, I know we've got time to watch other people's teachings because I'm talking about that. So I think we can uh, make time to watch. Uh, be watching Daniel's teachings and rewatch you know, my like relearn stuff I forgot about before, and I think a lot of like the Oneg discussion that Dan mentioned in his past commentary would uh, kind of clear up if uh, we if we were if we did all take the practice of digging into our Bibles more and um, and watching the teachings and getting like the biblical and historical context. And, Okay, and so back to our regularly scheduled um, sermon. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. I'm sure a lot of you want to know about the uncovering feet. I'm sorry, I don't really get into... Uh, and I don't, I don't recall what, how Matthew covered it and stuff. I still haven't gotten all the way through the book, so I'm hoping he covers this more. But um, I think the main point covered in the last slide. So. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself. And there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, the Hebrew root word for wing here is kanaf, which is also the word used in Zechariah 8.23, Corner Fringe's ministry verse, and in Numbers 15, indicating where the zephites are to be attached. So we can see the symbolism of Gentiles receiving God's commandments here. Also of note is the Hebrew word for close relative. It's uh, goel, means to redeem or act as kinsmen. Now, the Hebrew word... Uh, uh, is also translated as avenger, redeemer, elsewhere in the Bible. And we'll look at this more later. So I'll point that out right now. Okay, uh, 310. Then he said, Blessed are you of Yahweh, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. And now, going over like Boaz's age earlier, this, like uh, he's explaining here in verse 10, like she is, she sacrificed before coming back with uh, Naomi. And like Boaz is telling her here, this, this kindness is even better than that. And she's making an even greater sacrifice. So you see, Ruth intercedes with Boaz and presents herself as a sacrifice for Naomi. It says, Ruth, like Gentiles, intercede and sacrifice for Israel's redemption. Now it is true that I am a close relative. 
However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be, that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as Yahweh lives. Lie down until morning. Now there are three goels, or kinsmen, or kinsmen redeemers in the story. Boaz, the closer goel that he just mentioned, and Obed. Now as Matthew points out in his series, goels isn't the proper way to pluralize a Hebrew word. I just want to mention that as my Hebrew classmates wouldn't have let me hear the end of it if I didn't. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Also, he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me. For he said to me, do not go empty handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, sit still, my daughter until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Now Matthew was saying Naomi knew Boaz wouldn't rest because the six ephahs of barley represented six days. We do not rest until the seventh day. Chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, Sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. Now the word uh, that's translated friend here in Hebrew is poloni almoni, or literally uh, so-and-so, as the footnote of Bible Gateway uh, indicates. Or looking on a Bible hub, such a one. So it indicates that Boaz and this relative weren't very close. Okay. And he took two men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Okay, now in his study, Matthew goes into detail about how Torah lays out that a son born to a remarried widow would receive the inheritance of the widow's deceased husband along with his father's inheritance. Then his father's inheritance would go to the line of the widow's previous husband. That's why Mr. Such One was concerned about ruining his own inheritance. Now Matthew's also thinking that Mr. So-and-so here represents the law, citing verse 6 here as one reason. The relative said he cannot redeem, just like the law cannot redeem us. It's also thinking too, like, uh, it's interesting, this, the Mr. So-and-so is like a closer relative to, uh, to Ruth. It's kind of like, it's like the law, even though it can't redeem us, it's not God. It gives us, it's closer to us and that we have it written down and uh, it gives us great insight into God's character. So I thought that was kind of another uh, correlation there, perhaps. Okay, again, by marrying Ruth, the Goel was committing to sacrifice his son and possibly all his inheritance to the deceased man's family. So who will redeem or require sacrificing of only son? So the near relative of the law is not able, but Boaz, just like God, is able and willing. So God desired to sacrifice his son to save both Jews and Gentiles. Now, this was a custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. 
to confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was, that was Hilion's and Mahlon's from the hand of Naomi. So Boaz gives pledge to take to Naomi. God sends a pledge through Gentiles as a sign of redemption. The end of the harvest is at hand. And Boaz pays the price to redeem Naomi. It says God paid the price to redeem us and God redeems Israel. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mahlon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. Boaz marries Ruth to provide an heir to inherit all. It says God's son inherits the world. Believers inherit God, or eternal life. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. Yahweh make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in, Eph in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which Yahweh will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, Yahweh gave her conception and she bore a son. So Obed the Redeemer is born, the son of Boaz and the son of Mahlon. It says Yeshua is the son of God and the son of man. God sends his son to redeem Israel and resurrect. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. So Ruth gave herself to be used for Naomi's redemption and was therefore said to be better to Naomi than seven sons. Love is only mentioned one time in the book of Ruth, when the women speak of the love that Ruth has for Naomi. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Obed means servant, like Yeshua came as a servant. Okay, so we see through Obed, just like through uh, Yeshua, resurrects the line of the dead, the dead branches grafted back in, and becomes an heir to all that belongs to Boaz and Elimelech, Israel fully redeemed. To wrap up, uh, Ruth ends with the genealogy. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. No, Salmo <coughs> Salmon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David. So, Ruth was the third Gentile woman in the line of Judah, the line of King David, and the line of Messiah. Tamar and Rahab. Boaz's mother were Canaanites. So Ruth and Naomi become co-heirs in all that Boaz owns through Obed. Jews and Gentiles, co-heirs of the kingdom of God through Messiah. Israel and Ruth like Gentiles are one in Messiah. Both gain full inheritance. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. And the sixth part of Matthew's video series is an hour-long episode of other biblical examples from both testaments of Gentiles and Jews working together. Gentiles cannot be saved or inherit the kingdom without Israel, and Israel cannot be saved or inherit the kingdom without Gentiles. Some examples of Jew and Gentile working out God's plan together, Joshua, the son of Nun, a Hebrew, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a Gentile, is a Kenizzite. 
the two faithful spies led Israel into the promised land to receive their shared inheritance. Naomi, a Hebrew, and Ruth, a Gentile, restored the line Messiah would come through and received their shared inheritance together through Obed. King Solomon, a Hebrew, and King Hiram of Tyre, a Gentile, built the first temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Paul writes of this in Romans, as we continue in chapter 11 that Daniel started reading from yesterday. Verse 30. For as you, Gentiles, were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through there, the Jews' disobedience, even so these Jews also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, Gentiles, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of Yahweh? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, there are some unfortunately placed chapter breaks in Romans and elsewhere in the Bible. And uh, keep in mind, there is no split in Paul's original letter, and 12.1 needs to be read in context with the rest of chapter 11. So we see a little diagram that is in the blueprint, kind of point, summarizing the whole thing. God sacrificed his only son, Yeshua's sacrifice brought mercy to all. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. See, disobedient Israel, Israel, some sacrifice so that Gentiles could be grafted in. That by Israel's disobedience, mercy would come to the Gentiles. Gentiles, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That by the mercy shown to you, they may be shown mercy. The book of Ruth and God's plan of redemption is centered around sacrifice. Now, um, just to kind of quickly go over like, how we can practically sacrifice ourselves for Israel, that's like a, what Yeshua's harvest, that's their whole goal of their ministry and stuff. Um, uh, like the, the blueprint, they offer for free and other stuff there that you can get the ebook. This they offer for free. It's a documentary, Living Stones Connecting with Believers in Israel. It comes with a, a little pamphlet that they give uh, advice on and stuff on uh, how, uh, how to bless Israel. And they are definitely, God told them about Yeshua. We got to share Yeshua with them. It's like they'll, they'll, they'll talk about like other like groups that will. Like try to bless Israel, but will keep like dual covenant. They'll try to keep Yeshua away, and and like in some of the their videos and stuff, it's you got to feel for the messianic believers there because they've got Christians coming over there telling them you don't need Yeshua, and it's and it's just like the church is really misled, and uh, they really need this message. But yeah, watching this video, it's it's kind of heartbreaking. Like persecution they're under there from like Orthodox Jews and stuff and they just really want to hear from from other believers like believers here in the US they want to like pray together uh, and uh, so yeah um, so I'd recommend like checking out the website um, and yeah also just to quickly mention they, they have congregations there with Arabs coming in too and so you see like Arabs and Israelites uniting in Yeshua and stuff. And it's just really, yeah, beautiful. So, um, so I don't know if I did for time. Uh, that's it. So thanks.